VHF, UHF, uh, SHF, etc. Now these are just quite old terms that have stuck, which just give us a convenient sort of um, label to apply to particular parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now when we, and they're all sort of in, 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 de, in, multi, in convenient mathematical multiples of three. So low frequency or LF, that goes from uh, 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz. That's LF in there. Um, sorry, that's medium frequency. <laughs> Sorry, you do make mistakes on this. Low frequency is below that. Low frequency is 30 to 300. Medium frequency, or MF, is 300 to 3 megahertz. We've only got one MF band, that's a 160 meter band. High frequency is three, covers 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz. So each, each band chunk is a multiple of 10. Okay, 30 to 300, 300 to 300 to 3,000 kilohertz, 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz, multiple of 10. So that's a high frequency band. A lot of activity in that particular band, 3 to 30. That's where we do most of our long distance ionospheric based communications, you know, talking around the world without using satellites or bouncing signals off the moon. VHF is 30 to 300 megahertz, another multiple of 10. That's VHF. UHF 300 to 3000 megahertz or 3 gigahertz and SHF super high frequency. Yes for super, yes it is super. <laughs> Old terms. Um, SHF is 3000 to 30,000 megahertz and that's where most of the spot point to point microwave links and that's also uh, satellite links and so on and you know um, direct broadcast TV off satellites is in that SHF range in the three uh, 3,000 to 30,000 megahertz range or uh, three, 3 to 30 gigahertz range, same thing. So that's how the spectrum is divided up and how it relates to amateur radio. I'll just come talk a bit about VHF and UHF because if you go on to AREC, Amateur Radio Emergency Communications and so on, it becomes of some interest because we, uh, we do get practically involved in this these days when we a part of other organizations providing communications. We do find ourselves able to use type approved equipment outside of amateur bands when we're part of another service like uh, civil defense or rural fire or something like that. So VHF 30 to 300 megahertz on our spectrum line. Now in there is quite a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, we've got one, we've got two amateur bands, we've got the 6 meter band around about 50 megahertz, we've got the 2 meter band around about 150 as you saw before. But spotted amongst that is quite a lot of important stuff, some of it causes us problems. Around the, two, the, two, the 6 meter band is television, that's where TV channels start. TV channel 1 and channel 2 is around the 40 and 50 megahertz band, so that's where we start to get into um, TV channels. Sorry, uh, I can't remember exactly where they are, one and two. And, um, and then higher up, or, or, or below, below about the 70 megahertz mark, you've got another, some more TV channel in there. And then there's more television once you start getting above about 170 megahertz. So I've run out of room, there's 300. Around 170 to about 220, there's uh, the final lot of channels up to channel 10 in the VHF range. So there's a whole lot of TV channels stuck in there. As well as that, there's some interesting commercial stuff. Around about 70 megahertz is the Emergency Services A band or ESA, you'll see mentioned, around about 75 megs, and that's where police and the fire service are based, and they use FM there. Um, between um, if we just spread the scale out a bit. If we're starting here now at about 100, uh, come up here to 88 megahertz, 88 to 108 FM broadcasting, 108 to, 100, to about 138 is aviation. 
the lower end is parts of um, uh, uh, instrument landing system and also part of um, uh, nav navigation aids for aircraft and, um, and then starting from about 118 to 138 is air to ground voice AM communications. 138 to 144 is the ESB, emergency services B band and the ambulance service is in there, uh, there may be moves but the fire service in there as well and uh, civil defence and so on and Department of Conservation for some reason got their repeaters in there. 144 to 108, 148 of course is a 2 metre amateur band. And once you get skiing around the 150s you've got what's called the E band which is a commercial band for uh, commercial operators and things and then I won't draw the frequency now it gets a bit laborious. Above the E band is marine up, up from about 156 to about, about over 160 that's um, marine uh, VHF communications, short range marine stuff. Slotted in between there is uh, telepaging and then once you start getting above that there are some bands which are little used in New Zealand. There's some more commercial bands available like the EE band and then you get into the TV channels. Um, and then as you get up to the UHF you find other interesting, there are some commercial bands up there between 400 and 500 slotted around the 70 centimetre band. Um, and once you start getting higher up again, up above um, 500 odd, you start getting to UHF TV and then um, some radar frequencies as well. And then finally when you get up around the 800 megahertz range, between 800 and 850 and 900, these aren't exact, into cell phones and so on. So that's just a bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. I hope I've <laughs> gone on a bit much there, I'm sorry. It's not strictly examinable but I think it's useful to to get a handle on some of this stuff and uh, once you've been dealing with it for a while you do start to memorise it, um, impress people at parties and social functions and, and, uh, and so on. And if I didn't draw pictures off the other direction, below the low frequency band down to VLF you also can get down to extra low frequency where you're talking like 3 kilohertz to 30 kilohertz and that's uh, some really weird stuff down there, we're going extremely long wavelengths and that's where electromagnetic waves have the ability to penetrate into seawater and that's where uh, the military used to talk to uh, nuclear submarines and so on to probably not so much call them in for a pizza but call them up to the surface to um, tell them to fire off some nukes or something along those lines. So there you are, a bit about uh, frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, Welcome to the first um, section that we're going to cover in our DVD series and it's um, called Electronics Fundamentals which ties in with the particular question and in, uh, in the uh, particular question bank in the uh, syllabus for New Zealand Amateur Radio Examination. Now in, in radio and electronics we're really interested in what electrons do and uh, how we can use them for our own, uh, our own means and uh, hence the term electronics to do with electrons. So let's just talk a, a bit about uh, what we mean by electrons and a bit about matter and so on and we'll, we'll move through into a basic electricity in just a moment. Now all matter is composed of atoms and uh, an atom is the smallest thing you can divide something down into an element down into and still keep its characteristics. So it doesn't matter how big or small it is, it still behaves that way. So let me take a chunk of copper and if we keep dividing it down, dividing it down, dividing it down into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually you'll come to this, let's pick up at the end top here, this small fuzzy atom of copper and if you cut it any smaller it's no longer copper it's something else and that's what we mean by an atom. Now I mentioned element before, um, copper as an example is an element and so is hydrogen and oxygen but water isn't. Now elements are th those uh, things that are atoms in their natural state 
uh, sorry, they're just composed of one single type of atom. So a chunk of copper will only have copper atoms in it. There might be some impurities there. Hydrogen, a room full of hydrogen gas has only got hydrogen in it, and same with oxygen. However, water is a molecule. And uh, a molecule means several different atoms joined together. Or it can be the same type of atom joined together in some cases, but water is a, is a hydrogen atom and a couple of oxygens joined onto it. Hence the term H2O. There's two O's there. So that's just an aside, but that's what we mean by an atom. You can divide a, an element up into its uh, smallest thing and still keep its character, and that, that's what you're dealing with as an atom. If you go smaller than an atom, that's when you get into the world of electrons and so on. And if we take the most basic atom, which is a hydrogen atom, that's composed of one proton and one electron. Now, the proton is in what's called the nucleus in the centre of the atom, and whizzing around the outside of the proton is, uh, is an electron. Now hydrogen uh, has just one proton and one electron. The, the, the characteristics of the atom are determined by the number of protons in the nucleus. So hydrogen has one proton. If you add a second proton, it becomes helium. You add a third proton, it becomes lithium, and so on. Right up to, uh, to larger numbers, for instance, um, uh, nitrogen has seven electrons, sorry, protons in the nucleus, and uh, copper has 28. That's its atomic number. We won't, we won't get too bogged down on that. But suffice, suffice to say, the number of protons in the nucleus is what determines what the stuff, that, what the atom will be. It's quite amazing when you think about it. It's just one of those things it is, really. Now, the proton has a positive charge. An electron has a negative charge, and they're both equal amounts of charge but opposite. So an atom to stay neutral, generally speaking, um, has an equal, we'll come on to ions in a minute where that's not the case, but generally speaking, for every proton there's an electron, they, they balance up. So the helium atom with two protons in the nucleus will have a second electron somewhere else whizzing around it. Interest, just as an interest aside, classically it's described as being like a solar system and the electrons are whizzing around like planets. Well, no, it's not actually correct. The electron, you don't need to know this to the exam, but the electron is just a fuzzy blob that's smeared out around the atom and you can't pin it down to any one particular place at any one time. It's just not possible to do that. Quite, quite interesting when you think about it. There are other particles you find in the nucleus as well, uh, neutrons which don't have any charge, and they affect the, the weight of the atom. Um, but uh, they don't affect the, char the, um, the, the, the characteristics of it. Uh, in other words, it's the protons that determines what, what, what type of atom it is. There's, there are a varying number of neutrons in, in, in the nucleus as well. Um, hydrogen doesn't have any neutrons, whereas helium has uh, one neutron and one uh, proton. Well, we're getting a bit beyond the, the course there. Um, and just to, for interest's sake, um, pre-Rutherford, everyone thought that the nucleus was this lump of protons with electrons studded in it, and uh, I thought it was like a plum pudding. And it wasn't until Rutherford came along and fired alpha particles at a sheet of very thin gold foil as an experiment, and he found that, that most of them went straight through. Alpha particles are just a helium nuclei, they're a proton and a neutron, but every now and then one of them would come straight back. And he described it as being as if you fired a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper and it came straight back at you. And it was Rutherford who worked out that most of matter as we know it is, is empty space, there's nothing there. So the bulk of the mass of our atoms are actually in the proton, they're very heavy. And the electrons are very light, and what's in between is empty space. So the, the bulk of stuff around us, all these solid things that I'm rubbing this whiteboard off with now, is actually nothing. <laughs> bizarre when you think about it, isn't it? Right. Just a bit about um, attraction and repulsion while we're talking about charge. This becomes important in things like vacuum tube valves and, uh, and TV tube, picture tubes and things like that. The trick you can do um, when you rub a, a pen on a piece of wool or something like that and pick up little pieces of paper, that's to do with attraction and repulsion. Um, 
light charges repel, opposite attract. So that's a classic experiment when you have the balls of pith suspended on cotton that you do at school and um, if one's got a uh, negative charge. Now how we do that, that's where it has an excess of electrons. As it turns out electrons can move uh, away from atoms but protons are stuck for the ride. They're stuck in the nucleus, they can't go anywhere for all intents and purposes. We can actually remove some electrons off the other one. We can do that by various tricks on what you rub uh, materials on and then touch it up against. If we remove some electrons off that ball there, it leaves a sort of a, a net positive charge because of the protons left behind and some electrons are gone so it's got a positive charge and these will attract. Likewise if you happen to charge them both negative or both positive, it doesn't matter, they'll actually push each other apart, they'll repel. And that's all to do with the subject of electrostatics or static electricity. But the most common place where you see attraction and repulsion is when you look at your um, uh, TV picture, provided it's not a um, liquid crystal or one of those other uh, systems, but the old good old fashioned glass picture tube um, relies on, on this phenomenon. And um, if you take a cross section of the average picture tube, whoops, that looks more like a, a beer flagon, doesn't it? <laughs> Here's a, this is a cross section. Here's a screen looking at the front here. Now in the back you have electron guns. You actually have three, one for each colour, red, green and blue, and they line up with a special shadow mask to hit different coloured phosphors, red, green and blue on the screen. We won't go into that. And uh, they have magnetic coils around here to deflect the electron beam in the particular place required to scan the, 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 the picture. But these things have to be accelerated out across the space, empty the vacuum in the picture tube and hit the screen. And that's done by having a special conductive lining on the inside of the picture tube coming all the way around it. So it comes all the way out and around and there's a special cap. If you ever look at, at the side of a, a picture tube, you have this special black cap there and it helps keep the uh, atmosphere out because it's uh, running at a quite a high voltage, maybe about 30,000 volts, 30 kilovolts, 30,000 volts. And um, if your conductor gets exposed to the air, you get that noise that you hear off high voltage power lines. You get a hissy corona discharge noise, sort of a sizzling fat frying noise, so that could be annoying. So they have a special cap there to keep the atmosphere off the connection. And what happens is the negative electrons firing out here get attracted to this ring around here, but they don't hit it, they just keep whistling straight through. They get enough speed up that they uh, hit the screen and uh, excite the phosphor atoms on the screen and make them glow. So that's a little positive anode it's called around the inside there and it's attracting the electrons. Right, um, just come on now to, um, let's try a different pen. Conductors and insulators, very important. Now, electricity is a flow of electrons through a conductor. So we'll come back to an example of a conductor in a minute, but I'll just quickly show you what I'm talking about. Most common conductor we think of are, um, this is a power lead for connecting into a high frequency transceiver and that goes to the power supply terminals there. It's wove of copper, multiple strands of copper to make it easily flexible. If it was a solid chunk it would be quite stiff. And it's got an insulator. So here's an example of conductor and insulator. Here's the PVC uh, insulator around the outside. Here's the copper conductor on the inside. Here's a smaller piece there, copper on it sticking out the end. Plastic insulation, PVC around the outside. Now when we talk, the most common conductors we talk about are metals. And by that we mean copper. Uh, silver is used in some radio frequency applications because it's about the, about the best conductor there is, especially when it gets um, a bit corroded, um, tarnished. 
the good thing about silver is a tarnished layer conducts as well as a silver does, so um, that's why silver is quite popular. Um, gold, there'll be the and uh, aluminium actually. The power grids are strung up with uh, with aluminium conductors because they're light. Um, Copper is most commonly used conductor. Um, gold is also used in, um, silicon, in, in integrated circuitry for connections to the outside world. They use gold wires. Um, but copper, obviously, because it's cheap and readily available, and aluminium are the most commonly used conductors around the place. Now, metals uh, have an interesting property in that, and, and I won't draw the individual protons and neutrons, but a copper nucleus has got. 28 uh, protons in it and a variable number of neutrons and, and floating around the outside uh, are all the electrons. The electrons are actually in layers but the, it's the outer ones that we're interested in. The outer layer of electrons in metals are very easily free to come and go as they please. So when you've got a, a, a mass of copper atoms and here's the outermost layer of, of, of electrons Here's all the, uh, the, the uh, nuclei here. We won't draw all the other 27 uh, electrons inside. These electrons are actually able to hop around from one atom to the other very easily and, and move around. It's like a, a free sort of sea of electrons. And does that actual, this, that sea of electrons gives metals some of their important characteristics. One of them is it's shiny. Here's some aluminium foil uh, that's protecting a, um, a circuit board inside there. It's actually an interface board for programming a Yaesu FT897 transceiver I bought off China, uh, Trade Me. I think it's some Chinese reverse engineered thing or something. And that's just to protect it from static electricity with a foil around the outside. But the, the thing I wanted to show you is it's shiny. All metals, when you freshly cut them, are shiny. Even plutonium is a metal is shiny for a little while when you first cut it. You don't want to obviously breathe the dust in it, it's very toxic. But, um, and that's because of the interaction, just as an aside, but, but between light and these electrons. And it reflects light readily. The other thing is too that uh, metals conduct heat well. And that's because heat is actually thermal agitation and so on in, in, um, and, and matter, and these electrons moving around are able to sort of carry um, energy around the place. So just as an aside. Now, th this property of, of um, and, and, and things like copper and aluminium where these outer most electrons can freely come and go, is what allows it to conduct electricity. So if you imagine this is a, a wire, and we just happen to have blown up the atom inside there and enlarged them, if we provide some means of attraction or, or a nudge to make the electrons flow, and probably the, the easiest way to do that is with a, uh, a battery, and we'll come on to batteries in a minute, we can uh, make these electrons move easily. So if we connect a battery, we'll come on to the symbol for a battery in a minute. Here's a little, say a little, uh, one one and a half volt cell, Duracell or something. It's got a positive terminal at one end and a minus at the other. And we connect it with a conductor to this bigger conductor here for illustration purposes. Something interesting happens. Now, on your average, on your batteries, you've always got a positive and a negative terminal. On the little double A here, digital or alkaline, it's got plus at one end and minus at the other. On here. This uh, rechargeable lead acid battery, there's a plus and a minus, and the plus has got a red by convention. Red is plus, black is minus as well. You see the different colours here. It's amazing how easy it is to hook equipment up around the wrong way. Trust me, I've done it and I've blown things up. Here's a larger rechargeable lead acid battery, getting a bit heavier. Red, black, plus, minus. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. But the, intri the, the special thing about batteries is that on the miners terminal, the metal conductors on the miners terminal, there is an excess of electrons. There's electrons just dying to jump off there. And on the plus terminal, there's a deficiency of electrons. Okay, they're, they're, it's wanting to attract them in. 
and that's what happens. The excess of electrons can now flow around the wire here, move into the conductor, hop from, of course the same thing's happening <laughs> in our con conductors here, hop from atom to atom and then leave the wire and come out to the other end and flow into the positive terminal where there's a deficiency of electrons. And that's uh, how electricity is conducted. Um, and that's what drives our 21st century economy, well apart from oil I suppose, <laughs> is this stuff moving through um, high voltage power lines to, uh, between power stations and from one city to another and running around town through the motherboard of your, um, of your uh, computer, your compact or your HP or whatever, is um, this is really what drives us. <laughs> Modern society is this, electrons moving through conductors and doing, being exploited to do different things. Um, we talk about current flow and we can actually measure it. Now we'll talk about this stuff in more detail later. And we actually measure current flow and the unit of the current flow is the amp. Okay. Now the amp is actually a very large number. It, it is 6 by 10, 20, 28 electrons per second. I'll draw an exclamation mark after that. You might want to reflect on that. So your average um, lantern battery, here's one here, with a torch bulb in there, I don't know what are they, about 3 watts or so, something like that, half an amp. We'll come on to watts power calculations later. So when you flick the switch on your torch battery, on your torch with a battery like that, there's about half of that, there's about 3 by 10 to the 28 electrons per second whizzing through the conductors inside the torch you're holding. Now when you see a, a 10, some of you may not be familiar with this, it depends how much maths you've done at school, 6 by 10 to the 28, that's 6 with 28 zeros after it. So not 6,000, not 6 million, not 6 billion, not 6,000 billion or trillion, whatever you want to call it. 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, 12. We're not even halfway there. <laughs> so that's an incredible amount. So I just sort of mentioned that. that. That unit, if you're interested, is called the Coulomb. Not an examinable, but uh, that's a, a nice convenient chunk of electrons called the Coulomb. One amp is one Coulomb flowing in a second, in a circuit per second. Just put it in perspective. Oh, the, um, the average fan heater, when this is plugged up to a 230 volt outlet, there will be um, 10 amps flowing. So it's 60 by 10 to 28, 10 amps. You can see why it's easier just to say amps rather than those other numbers. It's just a convenient measure of current flow. Uh, the large conductors you see running between cities at 220,000 volts or higher, there'll be a couple of thousand amps flowing through those. A lot of electrons flowing. Um, now, insulators, covered conductors. Insulator is the opposite of a conductor. It will not allow current to flow and there are some places where that's critical and here's the example coming back to this. We've got the copper on the inside, the plastic PVC polyvinyl chloride insulator on the outside. We don't want electrons to uh, short circuit to just take an easy route from the power supply and the, uh, touch the wire and back again. We want it to go through our radio and make it do things for us and that's where the insulator comes in. And an insulator is composed of atoms, or generally they're molecules uh, that when we use them, in other words there are atoms joined to, to, together uh, in repeating patterns and that one's polyvinyl chloride so it's some kind of um, carbon chain with um, chlorines and other things joined onto the side of it. But it has the property, and glass is another one, silicon dioxide, so a silicon atom with a couple of oxygen joined on, is molecules that are insulators uh, do not have any free electrons. The electrons in the structure, say like silicon dioxide, which is glass, which is a very good insulator, uh, a lot of um, quite, quite nice and harder to get hold of these days, aerial insulators that amateurs use, use Pyrex glass. The, the electrons in the outer layer, the oxygen, the silicon and all that, are tightly held in in this molecule and they do not want to go anywhere. They're not available for shifting off. So when you've got a whole lot of these molecules in a chunk of material, 
if you attach a wire to it, and there are none available for any movement that will not conduct electricity. And um, the exception is if you crank the voltage up, the electrical pressure, we'll come on to voltage in a minute, across the conductor too high, you'll get to a point where yes it will conduct, we can actually, the, the stress, the electric stress if you like, the, 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 there's so much excess electrons on one side and the deficiency on the other, and it's so much energy available there to try and make a current flow that, that can break down. And that happens um, uh, when lightning strikes an antenna or something like that and you find um, your coaxial aerial cable is suddenly um, charred between the outer and the inner conductor and that's because the voltage, the pressure if you like of electricity is so high it can actually break through the, um, break down the insulator. But for all intents and purposes um, when we're running at 13.8 volts our transceiver that degree of insulation is perfectly fine it will handle it quite fine. If, like uh, with some, some people, you know, it's still quite common to use high powered valve amplifiers and they might have three or four thousand volts uh, supply in a separate power supply box, you wouldn't use that to wire from one to the other. That wouldn't stand that degree of, um, of electrical pressure across there and the insulator would fail. Right, that's insulators. Common insulators, so I mentioned glass, uh, ceramic materials, these are sort of things you see aerial insulators made out of, uh, many plastics, PVC, polythene, things like that, they're all different types of plastics, will insulate quite well, um, air, a classic example of that is where you've got high voltage power lines and they're, they're, the conductors are bare, but the air in between is a very good insulator. Um, and there's one more I was going to mention. 